What's the most important when buying speakers? Frequency response, SPL, and so forth. Hey guys, welcome today. It's all about speakers. I just recently got new speakers, my dream speaker set up for the studio right here. And I thought, why not make a video and like talk about some misconceptions everyone really should know about when buying speakers, so like a buying guide, and also answer your questions about speakers, which speakers to buy, how to choose the right speaker for your setup. Let's, let's maybe get started with a couple of questions first. Do you have to break in your speakers? So just for, for the ones that don't know what he's talking about, when you buy new speakers, some manufacturers and some people online say you should run them for like a day or two on lower volume and break them in so that things within the speaker settle and they find the right position or whatever. <sighs> I personally think it's to 99% not necessary and, and very close to voodoo bullshit that manufacturers tell you some, not all of them, some tell you to do because they want you to not return the speakers. Some people buy speakers, aren't that happy and want to send them back and then the, the manufacturer responds, hey, break them in then they'll sound correct and then think again about it. And usually by then the time you're allowed to send them back is over. So it's, uh, I mean, yes, the sound changes slightly, 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 slightly. I'd say 0.001%, which is probably not really audible. Like I, I've seen scientific studies about it that did measurements and the measurements, the differences were so fine that the difference in temperature in your room actually changes the sound more. And like just from an engineering point of view, like what is supposed to break in? I mean, it doesn't make a lot of sense. So if you buy speakers, don't like them, send them back straight away. How many organs did you have to sell to afford them? Yes, these, these speakers are expensive. I saved long. And the main reason for getting them is that I heard them in a lot of other studios and they were always like a little above the rest. And I consider them being the best speakers you can humanly possibly have in your studio. Of course, there's like personal preference, a, a factor part of it. But I just wanted to have something where I don't have to worry again about getting something else. Like the entire topic of speakers is done for me. Next up, by Hempel Audio, how low do these speakers go? Is a subwoofer necessary? I personally, like from the first testing that I shared with you yesterday, no subwoofer needed. They go down up to 25, 22 hertz, which is enough. Usually in mastering, you cut at 28, 30, 35, depending on the style of music and like the, the content you have down there. So it's, it's enough. I don't need the subwoofer. The subwoofer is very expensive and it just helps you to get the very low frequencies even lower and a little more and more is needed in this room right here. We've eliminated all of the room modes, like all of the buildups of sound because there's no reflection, no reverb, it's all absorbing material. So it's like plus minus three dB, something like that, which is very, very good. And I know some other DJs, producers, I think like Skrillex new studio has the same speakers plus the subwoofers. And I think also Zed is getting the same speakers plus the subwoofers. The noisier guys have these, like all of the Northward acoustic studio builds have these speakers. Um, they sometimes have the subwoofers, sometimes not. This really depends on the room, the room modes and your personal preference. And of course your budget. I, I won't spend 20k to have like 4 hertz more down there that, that I actually don't need. I cut it anyways. What's the most important when buying speakers? Frequency response, SPL, and so forth. <sighs> the most important, I, I would start with the budget. The budget is the most important because usually the more you spend, the better the speakers get but you have to spend a lot more to increase the quality just a tiny bit. So for a beginner, I'd start with like 500 euro speakers a pair. I personally absolutely love the net price range, the Yamaha HS series. I always had the 8 or 80M and they have enough bass. They're good for a bad room studio, for a smaller room. 
and I, I was able to do really good mixes with them. And then the level above it is usually like the 1000, 1200 plus range. We get like midfield monitors that have uh, usually a three-way system. And um, you have plenty of choice there. They're, they're all very, very like close to each other, all using same components, same parts. So it doesn't matter that much. The higher range is really up to debate personal preference you should always go and test the speakers go to a store where you can compare all of these speakers to each other pick the three four within your budget you like the best from the sound and order all of them to your studio you need to test the speakers in your studio a and b best having all of them at the same time in the studio and you will have your answer and your choice within five or six minutes because these speakers still sound kind of different when you hear them A and B next to each other. And it's totally up to your style of music, your room, your personal preference. You need to get them in the studio. I would never ever buy a speaker that is like a thousand plus without having it tested extensively. Also these that I got right here, I tested them over, over a year in different other studios. And I also had um, for two days like the same units just not the install version here in the studio to actually test them before before buying them. Do five or six inch near field speakers need a lot of room treatment? Thank you. Yes, <laughs> room treatment is always necessary. It doesn't matter how big your speakers are, usually near field monitors are closer to your ear. So yes, you will need a little less room treatment or you will hear, you, you have to, like you don't have to turn them up that much. So the room doesn't get excited that much and doesn't reflect as much, but it will still mess up your sound heavily, 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 especially on the low end, the room modes, they cancel out frequencies, they double frequencies, they triple frequencies. It's a huge mess. It's like, it's like imagine a swimming pool and throwing a thousand balls and they're all different size, different weight, and then the ripples that like are created that's usually what is happening in your room with like sound and you want to make sure that there is no reflection from the sides and the top and the bottom um, to have only the direct sound of the speaker. So my advice, as I already said a, a couple of days ago, spend at least as much money on acoustic treatment as you spend on your speakers. The room is more important than the speakers, 100%. Mike is asking, what made you decide on the ATC's 110s? Why not the larger ATC speakers with lower bass extension? I was thinking about the bigger ones. The bigger ones, I mean, they're not really bigger, the 150s. They are three-way speakers, same as these, but they have one woofer instead of two. These have two woofers. And the ones with the one woofer, is it's a bigger woofer, a 15-inch woofer. These are just 9-inch, which isn't that big, actually. The bigger the woofer, usually the lower the speaker can go. And also the more amount of air it can move, so it's louder. But there's one drawback, and that's the main reason why I got these. The bigger the woofer, the more it has to move, the more air it has to move, and the slower it is. So the, if you have a 15-inch woofer, it, it takes so long to move that like transients and, and like every, like the kicks and everything, it triggers it so much that it's slow and you can actually hear it. So I, I talked to like 10, 15 people that are specialized on these speakers, and they told me, they would always choose the version with the two smaller woofers. You still got, by doubling the woofers, the same loudness, the same, almost same extent to the low end, but they're faster. That's something that is hard to measure. That's really something you need to listen. Can you give some of your sample packs for free? <laughs> Uh, yes, we actually have like sample packs for free and we also have the newest sample pack that is like 50% off. It's just like half the price plus all of the old sample packs on top. I'll link it down below. Just go check it out. If you're interested, get it. It's the stuff that I'm actually using to make my songs. Is it better or worse to have them in the wall? Whew, that's debatable. Like a wall, mounting wall, like mounting them into the wall has advantages and disadvantages. Or actually it has mostly advantages, that's the reason why I did it. But you have to do it properly, otherwise it has a lot of disadvantages. So first of all, you need a room that has a certain size. So um, 
at least like three meters wide. This room right here is four and a half meters wide. So that it actually works just like physically putting something like this into the wall. I wouldn't build speakers into the wall that aren't meant for in-wall mounting. If you have a baseboard on the back, don't put them in a wall. If the amp is included in, in the speaker on the back, don't put them in a wall. You need speakers that are made for in-wall mounting. That's the first part. Then you have to do the in-wall mounting properly. I mean, just look at this. The wall doesn't touch the frame. The frame has rubber material in there and doesn't touch the speaker. Here on the bottom, to get rid of any vibrations, we have these special pads right here. And then again, this box doesn't touch the wall. So if I play music and I touch the speaker right here, it's vibrating. If I touch this frame, it's half. If I touch this part right here, which is right next to it, I can barely feel any vibration. It's then only the vibration that is transmitted through the air. So if I stand in front of the speaker, the vibration that hits my body through the air, that's the same you also get on, on the wood part. There's no way to counteract that. You can't stop air from like transmitting it. You, you would have to put them in a vacuum and then you can't really hear it again. But um, yeah, that's like the best system we found to, to build them into the wall. There is also a stand underneath because all of it, it's, it's not touching anything. It's only resting on, on, the, on this block of concrete. There's, uh, there are springs in there. There's acoustic dampening material. So all of the weight is just on here. And even the entire floor is dampened again with that special squishy material. And if you do all of that properly, you have the advantage that there is no speaker boundary interference. So within the speaker, there are frequencies that are being canceled out through the speaker, like tr transmitting all of the lower bass energy in all directions. It's not just to the front, it goes in all directions. And the speaker chassis, it's already dampening it a little. If you build more around it, it gets better. So the best approach is to make the, the wall where the speakers are built in as solid as possible, as thick as possible, as absorbing as possible. So you eliminate everything that is not forward facing. And then to, to extend the spread of the speaker, you put a reflective wall around it. That's the only wall that is not absorbing kind of makes the speaker sound bigger because the sound is like distributed over a bigger surface area. It sounds amazing, but it's hard to do. We did a lot of calculation. We even had to sign a non-disclosure agreement for certain stuff we did in this wall mount by, yeah, I can't even tell. <laughs> I can't even tell by whom, but yeah, it's, very complicated, but we managed to do it and, and it just sounds epic. Would you start mixing for Dolby Atmos in future now that Apple Music supports it? No, I, I don't see any benefit that adds to the music. I think it's a little gimmicky. It's fun, yes, but no. How much kidneys does one speaker cost? One and a half. When is the full studio tour coming? Once it's finished. <laughs> The front wall just needs like the proper, um, like what, what you've seen right now from the front, it won't be visible. I will buy um, probably like steel or aluminum and put it above it to finish the front wall and seal it entirely. What do hi-fi speakers do differently from monitor speakers for the studio? Um, it's basically like the, the, the tuning and the, the frequency response. Like a, a studio speaker tries to be as flat as possible and a hi-fi speaker tries to be as pleasing sounding as possible. So usually the lows and the highs are emphasized a little. What are your thoughts on hi-fi speakers as monitors? <sighs> if you have to, yes. Um, it's definitely more fun. It doesn't sound that boring. So I know a lot of producers that have um, like fun speakers to actually do the musical parts and select sounds, and then they do the mixing on more analytical speakers. But that's really, again, personal pre preference. Do you minimize acoustic issues in your room by mixing and monitoring at low levels? I used to in my old studio, um, I'd say like a medium loudness around like 60, 70 decibels is, is usually advised, maybe 80. If you go above it, your ear reacts differently. Here in the studio, we tested it, we measured it with a measurement mic. If you output quiet or loud, 
no difference. Like there's so much absorption, you can really put these speakers to max volume. All of the absorption is just like taking all of the, the mud away. Are the speakers slightly tilted? No, these aren't slightly tilted because um, we just put them on, on the exact height. Like the manufacturer told us they need to be on ear level, the mid driver, and five degrees up, which results here in like 22 centimeters above ear level. If you're now good in math, you can calculate how far the speakers are away from the seat spot. Good luck, have fun. No disrespect, but how do you justify 50k speakers money time-wise? So first of all, these speakers weren't 50k, uh, not even close to 50k. I, how do I justify it? Okay. First of all, like since two or three years, I know that music production is my life and will be my profession for the rest of my life because it's like, like I can make a steady income. So buying these speakers, there's there's no in three years giving it up and having to sell them again. Then I got these speakers slightly for less and I got them before I ordered them before the Brexit. So now they are actually two, three thousand more expensive. I could instantly sell them for more than I bought them. And in 10 years, they will still have almost the same value. So don't look at something that you buy the price you pay for it. Look at how much you pay per day you're using it. So let's say these speakers, I have them for 10 years. Then you subtract the, the loss you have. Let's say I lose 3000 euros, like from the actual value I bought them at. And then it's like I paid 3,000 euros for having really good speakers for 10 years. And then it's like really inexpensive. It's even cheaper than buying cheap speakers, trying to sell them on eBay and realizing no one wants them. Like if you buy crappy speakers and try to sell them, or if you buy like really nerdy gear, like some of the stuff I have here in my desk, it's really hard to sell actually. So that's just like from like an economics money perspective. I'm not wasting any money. I'm, I'm paying per day and it's worth it. Same with a computer. Expensive, but if you consider how much you use it, it's just a couple of cents per hour you're actually using it. And these tools enable me to make more money. These speakers will definitely get me more customers, will make my work faster, and are definitely worth the 3,000 and 10 years that I actually pay for them the money isn't gone. The importance of the position of the speaker, very important. Positioning is so important. You can make a half as expensive speaker sound twice as good by positioning it right. Do you hear the difference between MP3 and WAV? Yeah, 100%. Um, even on cheaper speakers, you can hear it. Is there really a difference worth that money? If yes, what exactly? <laughs> I mean, I could now try and explain it for an hour. You just need to sit here for a second and you'll get it yourself. So as promised, as soon as COVID is over, I'll do an open door day. Anyone that is interested can come here, sit here in this chair and listen to their favorite music. And what volume can they burst? They won't burst, they have a built-in limiter. Most speakers, actually all speakers nowadays have a limiter built in, so if you turn them up, the limiter just limits everything. They will start distorting and you'll turn it down again because it sounds like crap. What is the frequency response of your speakers? Um, I don't know. Like it says on their website plus minus 3 dB or something like that. Don't trust these kind of things. They're all lying. All of the manufacturers are lying. They're all lying to you and manipulating you in the biggest way possible. Test them yourself in your studio and you'll know like these frequency response charts, they're smooth to uh, a third octave, like which makes everything look flat. They, they lie about the loudness, the SPL. Some say it's 120 SPL, but in brackets down below, it says for both speakers. Then other companies tell you that for one speaker, ignore all of that, it's bullshit. Like it's, it's just pure bullshit, pure marketing. Um, if you see anyone on YouTube recommending anything, it's all paid, endorsed, bullshit. Get them, test them yourself. Don't even listen to me. <laughs>
<laughs> like really, if you want the speaker for you, you need to test it. I mean, you're also not doing online research, what food is the best for me to eat. You just know, because you just eat it. If you like it, you'll eat it again. It's very simple, same for speakers. You just have to go through the effort getting them into your studio. Most companies will let you like rent them, especially the higher priced ones. You can even get them for free for a week to test them. You need to test them. Do you get better mixes with better speakers even in a bad room? No, the room changes more. The room changes more. If I had to choose to get rid of the new speakers or this room, I would get rid of the speakers without even thinking about it and replace them with any other speaker that's still better than having these big, good, expensive speakers and an untreated room. The room changes so much. Uh, a good speaker to a perfect speaker, the difference might be plus minus two, two and a half dB in the frequency response. And yes, the transients, everything sounds crisper and more balanced and more accurate and more in time and more aligned. But a room can change the sound by 20, 30, 40 dB up and down. It looks, it looks so messy. It sounds so messy. So definitely the room is actually the key. And if you get both to match, you get closer and closer to perfect. Anyways, thanks a lot. I think I'll cut it right here. If you have any more questions, ask me down below in the comments. I'll try to answer as many as possible. Also, don't forget the sample pack because I had to sell kidneys for these speakers. I need some cash, so if you want to support me, have some new samples to make your music, be inspired and use the same stuff as I do in my music. It's all analog created here in the studio. Go check it out. There are also serum presets and all that good stuff. Link down below. Thanks for watching. Sign up.